Okay, I'd like to uh, welcome uh, Stefan Scholl, Delta Charlie 9, Sierra Tango. Hello, Stefan. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hello, Stefan. So, <laughs> uh, good to have you here again. Uh, you've been a contributor to the SRA in the past also, also with, with very interesting topics like time difference of arrival. I think that was your first contribution years ago and by the way, uh, concerning statistics, we've been talking about statistics, right? Uh, concerning about statistics, one of the most uh, heavily requested uh, contribution uh, in general, uh, looking to all our 100 videos. So that's uh, something that, uh, that that interests many, many people out there. And um, you've, you've come back uh, also with a very interesting topic that, that matches perfectly here in this uh, block. And the topic is classification of shortwave radio signals with deep learning. So Michael, uh, I think that also agrees with your interest very well. Um, yes, the audience, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> dear audience, for those of you who, who uh, don't know uh, Stefan, let me briefly present uh, his biography to you. So Stefan holds a PhD in communication engineering and uh, microelectronics, and he's currently working as a researcher at Fraunhofer in the domain of radar technologies. Uh, so, uh, well, Jean-Michel, uh, Stefan is also an interesting contact for you. <laughs> it's all about bringing people together, right? And, uh, well, radar electronics, and he's interested in signal processing and hardware for software-defined radios. Okay, as previously done, we are going to hand over to my uh, video Studio control colleagues, please video team, play the pre-recorded video. Hello everybody, my name is Stefan Scholl and in this presentation I will show the, how you can classify radio signals from the shortwave band with modern methods of deep learning. The talk is basically split up in three parts. First, the first part is about signal classification. Why do we use it and uh, what is it basically? The second part is dedicated to a brief introduction to neural networks and machine learning. And the third part is about an experimental system I have built that can classify shortwave signals into 18 different modes. So first of all, you can see a shortwave spectrum here. I've taken this from the well-known web, web SDR at the University of Twente, where you can view the whole spectrum from zero to 30 degree in one waterfall diagram. What you can see in this waterfall diagram is which frequencies are used. So where is somewhat somebody transmitting? What you cannot see is what the actual transmission mode is and how you can decode these signals that are there, how you need to set your demodulator or your decoder. I've copied out of the spectrogram a few signals and you can now test yourself if you are able to determine the modes of the signal by just looking at the spectrogram. The signal on the left-hand side is very characteristic because it has some on-off keying pattern and is very narrow band. And this signal is a Morse code signal. So you can basically see uh, the Morse code in the spectrogram. The second signal you can see here is very typical for AM broadcast signal. It has a very wide bandwidth and the spectrogram is highly symmetric. The third one is already a little bit harder. So this is typical for an SSB audio transmission, especially here in the lower sideband. This signal here is a HF fax signal. You can see from a very strong signal here, which is not perfectly centered in the band. Now it gets really hard. Look at this signal. It's very narrow band and you can't actually really determine what it is. It's PSK31, but it could be anything else like a pure carrier or another uh, transmission mode that has a very narrow bandwidth. 
This signal here is a digital signal. It's Olivia 4500. It's a 4 FSK signal. It's very hard to see. You need, really need to be an expert to figure out what this signal is. And that for this signal, you need to set the decoder to this mode. So you can figure out the mode by looking at the spectrogram, but it's sometimes quite hard and you need to have a lot of experience. So if you are an expert in that domain, it will be quite easy to determine a lot of modes. But if you're not so used to looking at spectrograms in the shortwave bands, it can be really hard to determine the modes. And what we want to do now is we want to see how we can automate this process of classification of modes. What is this good for? First of all, classification of modes is good for band observation. So we want to see what is going on on the bands, not just which frequencies are occupied, but also what type of transmissions are there. This is especially interesting for, uh, for example, for intruder detection, a problem we have um, very frequently in the amateur radio bands. And also for officials, it's important for law enforcement to see if everyone is transmitting in the band uh, where he is allowed to. Another interesting application is about rare mode operations. In amateur radio, we have, we often use the same modes like Morse code, SSB, RITI, PSK, the weak signal modes of, from Joe Taylor. But there are a lot of other different and highly interesting digi modes from a technical point of view. For example, there's Olivia mode. I've mentioned this one before. It offers a live chat with very low SNR, like minus 10 to minus 15 dB SNR. And there are also other modes like MT63, which is a O of the M like mode and it's a very robust mode and also Domino X, though it is not so fast, it's a very robust mode. The situation you uh, encounter and practice is often like this. You see a strange signal on the bands, you might find it interesting, but since you don't know it, you just skip it. And so you cannot establish any uh, communications with that mode. When you're interested in digging modes, I can also recommend this paper here. It's from uh, Neil Schiffauer, DK8OK. Um, you can download it, it's in German, but you can understand. Uh, also, if you're not uh, good at German, he, uh, he shows different digging modes and analyzes the performance of this mode, which is very interesting. Automatic mode classification is also important for the professional domain. Here in cognitive, we have cognitive radio as an emerging technology. Cognitive radio means you have a kind of intelligent radio that adapts itself to the spectral environment. So there is not a fixed frequency and not a fixed baud rate and also not a fixed modulation and bandwidth, but the radio looks for free spectrum and for a spectrum where it is allowed to transmit and transmit its information there. And classification of modes is one requirement to enable this new technology. So mode classification, what, is, what it is about is you have a received signal, you have some kind of processing machine, and this machine outputs the transmission mode which could be Morse, SSB, Audio, Olivia, we have seen these modes already. And these outputs are called the classes and this type of problem is a classification problem. The problem of mode classification is highly related to automatic modulation classification, where you input a signal, do some classification processing, and the output is a modulation type, like phase shift keying, frequency, uh, frequency shift keying, and so on. However, determining only the modulation is not enough to decode and uh, demodulate the mode, so it's not enough to read the transmitted messages. When you want to build a classification algorithm, you have basically two options nowadays. You have the classical way and you have the modern way of machine learning. 
The classical way means you try to find some characteristic properties or features of a signal and you build an algorithm step by step that calculates these features. This is a very good approach for well understandable problems where you have a theory, for example, or where you have a deep understanding of the, of the um, of, of these characteristic properties you require to distinguish between the classes. A more modern way is the machine learning approach. In a machine learning approach, you first collect masses of data and then you train a complex mathematical model with that data. And this is something that is very good for problems where you cannot directly figure out characteristic properties. And this is applied, for example, in image processing with great success. It does not mean that machine learning is always the best way, but it seems that for some kind of problems, this new way of machine learning classifiers are highly superior. To make the difference clear between classical algorithm design and machine learning, Let's assume a little task. You have to build a detector for AM broadcast signals. So an AM broadcast signal, the spectrum is depicted here. And the first thing you would do, you would find out what are the characteristic properties of these signals. What are properties that make an AM broadcast signal different from other signals? And by Looking at a spectrum and by having some experience, you could figure out maybe three properties. One is the bandwidth should be larger than three kilohertz. This spectrum is symmetric, so lower, uh, upper and lower sideband are symmetric. And there is always a large peak at the center frequency. These three properties I've chosen some kind of arbitrarily. You could probably choose uh, anything else and it's probably not the best way, but it is good to show the difference between the algorithm approaches. And one you have, once you have identified these three properties, we can build an algorithm that calculates these properties. So in this case, it could be you input IQ samples, you do some FFT to come up with a spectrum because all these properties are defined in the spectral domain. And then you can take an algorithm, some algorithm that calculates symmetry, some algorithm that, ca that calculates where the center peak is located, and some, uh, some algorithm that uh, calculates the bandwidth. And you take these three measures and you combine that into a logic. And um, yeah, you can determine if the signal is an AM broadcast signal or not. The advantage of this approach is that this algorithm can be fully understood by the designer, which sounds somehow natural, but we will see in a minute that this is not the case with machine learning. And you can easily debug this kind of classifying algorithm. Let's assume you have, you have built this machine. You input an AM broadcast signal, but the output tells you it's not an AM broadcast signal. So it's a wrong decision. You can then go back and check where the error in this processing chain has happened. Perhaps you could go back, look for the measure of symmetry, and maybe you see, oh, it's not symmetric. So we can even go a step back further and have a look at the spectrum. And maybe you can see in the spectrum, oh, it's not symmetric. So there's a kind of way to, to improve your algorithm um, by kind of debugging. But there are also some disadvantages. Are these three features really good? Or are there features which are even better? Yeah, this highly depends on the experience of the algorithm designer. And for some problems, it's even very, very hard to find characteristic properties. Let's think of a um, task in image processing where you have to distinguish between cats and dogs. Look at these six creatures. It's very hard to derive characteristic properties for cats uh, that make them different from dogs. So for this kind of application, classical algorithm design is very hard, if not impossible. 
The machine learning approach is an entirely different approach. First, you collect masses of data. You collect a lot of AM broadcasting signals and you collect a lot of signals that are not AM broadcasting signals. Then you take a mathematical model with many free parameters. You do some kind of training and in the end, you come up with a model that has fixed parameters and that is basically that defines basically formal calculations to detect an AM signal. What is the advantage here? Its uh, features can be very good since they have been obtained automatically by looking at the data or in, the, in the training process and the designer does not require any expert knowledge. However, it is often unclear how the model designs because there is no well-defined meaning of all these calculations in a mathematical model. And therefore, it's also hard to optimize analytically. A very commonly used model in machine learning is a neural network. A neural network is basically a model of the human brain, a very simple model. It consists of neurons, these circles here, that are connected with each other. And on the left, you input some data. This could be a signal or a spectrum of a signal or pixels from an image. And this information is processed from left to right. And on the right-hand side, you have these output nodes which correspond to the classes. Every neuron has a very simple behavior. It consists of several inputs. In this case, it's two, x1 and x2. And each input is weighted by a weight, w1, and for the second input, it's w2. And you add up a bias value. And after that, you take some, some operation which is called ReLU, ReLU means rectify a linear unit and basically it means that you force negative values to zero. And every neuron has one output that is calculated by this simple equation. You could also have a neuron with three inputs or more inputs. Then you again weight every input by a value and you add again a bias and take the ReLU operation to form a neuron that is a little bit more complex. To make the thing more powerful, you can now combine several neural neurons to form a neural network. Again, we have a neuron here with two inputs. We have a neuron here, a second one with two inputs. And we have seen on the slide before you can calculate the neuron and come up with this kind of formula. So it always consists of weighting, adding a bias and taking the real operation. And the same thing you can do here, but the weights are different and the bias is different too. And you can also go a step further and build some kind of hierarchical structure where you feed the outputs as an input to a third neuron. And again, you weight the inputs, you add a bias, you take the real operation to form the output. And here we have a very simple network with only three neurons. And you can see it, it's already a quite complex formula. So a neural network is uh, nothing else than like a complex functions, function that has many free parameters that can be fixed. Weights and biases can be fixed later during the training process. An even more complex neural network. You can see that now the, the hierarchy is larger. We have arranged the neurons in different layers, one layer, two layer, three layers. And this network already has 41 weights, 10 biases and 10 times a real operation. So the output here is really a, a very complex function now. And you can add also a second output neuron 
And you can, there is also a function defined for the second output. And every output neuron corresponds to one class. And the neuron here has like the formal calculation to detect the class one, and the neuron here has, it contains the formal calculation to detect the class two. So there are different types of layers in the neural network. What we have seen so far is a dense layer where every node is connected with every other node. It's called a fully connected layer and it contains a lot of weights and it's quite complex to train. So researchers have come up with some more structured layers. One very commonly used layer is the convolutional layer. The convolutional layer has some very specific structure. A neuron is only connected to a very few preceding neurons. And there is also some kind of structure. When you, are, when you have some knowledge on signal processing, this, may, this kind of structure may be familiar to you because it's a convolutional structure. And in a radio signal processing, you often talk about filters. And what you do is in a convolutional layer, you often put several filters in parallel to enhance the power of this layer. And there's also a third one, a pooling layer. Pooling layer basically means you take the maximum out of two input layers. And the purpose of the pooling layer is to reduce the number of neurons in the layer to reduce the neural network in order to make it not too complex. A typical convolutional neural network is used in praxis. It is uh, based on an input layer and then we have some con a convolutional layer with several filters. And after that, you have a pooling layer. Yeah, you could also have like two convolutional layers and a pooling layer or even more, but it's always the structure of having convolutional layers and then pooling. And then you repeat that again, convolutional pooling. And you could also take like a third step of convolutional pooling. This is a very typical approach when designing modern neural networks. And in the end, you have some kind of dense layer, densely connected layer, which are connected to the output layers to the output layer uh, where each neuron corresponds to one class. The term of deep learning refers to neural networks that have many layers like tens or hundreds of layers because neural, uh, deep learning is, um, deep learning neural networks are very powerful, are hard to train, but are very powerful. I want to give you an example of a neural network that is uh, very famous. It's the AlexNet. AlexNet is a network that can do image classification. So you can give him, a, uh, you can give it an image and he will determine what is the, what can be seen on that image. And it is able to distinguish between 1000 classes. Yeah? For example, you have like a mite here, a container ship, motor scooter, leopard, and so on. There are a thousand different classes. The input layer of this network has 150,000 neurons. It has eight layers in total and 600,000 neurons in total. And here you can see the structure of this network. It's some kind of convolutional network. And in total, it has 60 million parameters. So 60 million weights and biases. So this kind of processing that we have here is very, very complex and though also very, very powerful. The question is now, how do we determine all these weights and biases? And that is done during training. A neural network can basically operate in two modes. One is the training mode and the other one is like the prediction mode or where we use the neural network to make predictions. In the training mode, um, you feed in data, you determine the weights and biases. Um, this is a very complex process. This is done usually in the design phase and you can also, you basically you have to do it once. 
So you can put a lot of effort in training neural networks in terms of like high performance computers and in terms of calculating this training for a very long time. And once it is trained, you can deploy it. Weights and biases are fixed. And you can basically use the network by just inputting unknown data and outputting, and it outputs the classification result. And calculating the prediction of a neural network is a quite simple task. We have seen before that the neural network is basically having um, additions and some multiplications. And that's it. So no, not many complex operations. And it's also very good for um, parallelization on a GPU or on a computer chip. How does training work? First of all, we need data. So a data set consists of the single data, which could be a signal, a radio signal in our case. And you need to have the data label. The data label is in our case like um, the true class, which could be a Morse code or any other radio mode. And these labels are usually very hard to obtain because you need a lot of data and like labeling this data is usually done by hand or by using some kind of synthetic generation of data. When training a neural network, you first initialize the weights and biases randomly. Then you take data, you calculate the output of the neural network, which is basically of very low quality because all the weights and biases are just random values. And you compare that output with a true data label. And obviously in the first place, it's very probable that, this, that the output of the neural network is not the correct class. So what you do then is you do some kind of training step. That means you modify all weights and biases such that the network output gets better. So usually you use some kind of gradient decent algorithm for that. It's called uh, back propagation. And once you have done this, the weight gets a little, the, the neural network has a little bit better weights and biases. And you do that again with the next data, this process. And you do that, you repeat that process for all data in the data set. And if you have done this, it's called an epoch. And usually during training, you don't do just one epoch, but you have many, many epochs, like 10 epochs, 100 epochs, or even more. And over the time, the network trains to get better, to get better, and in the end, you come up with a neural network that is able to classify the data very well. Okay, so this is how you can build a neural network, how you can train a neural network. And in the next step, we will check how we can class how we can build a classifying system that detects 18 modes that are commonly used on the short wave bands, also under noisy conditions. And the question is, can a neural network learn short wave radio signals? First of all, we have to talk about the data set and about the modes that the classifier can distinguish. The 18 different modes are depicted here. It's for example, Morse code, PSK31, PSK63, QPSK31. Some RITI modes, which have, here these two modes have a very high similarity. So it's both FSK, 170 hertz of shift and the baud rate differs only by five baud. We have some modes from the Olivia type, Domino X, MT63, Navtex, USB audio, LSB audio, AM broadcast signals and HF fax. So there are also some analog modes. And as you can see in this column, the modes are, uh, the modes cover widely different modulation types and also different baud rates. The question is how to obtain the training data because you really need a lot of data for training. My approach here was to generate the data synthetically 
synthetically means I take software like FLDigi to generate sig to generate um, the modes for the for the digital transmissions, and for analog um, transmissions I take speech and music, and I use some kind of analog modulator AM and SSB to generate the baseband signals. Then I add some kind of noise from an AWGN channel such that the resulting signals have an SNR between minus 10 to 25 dB. Next I add a Watterson model. I will talk on, about this in one minute. And finally I add some random frequency and phase offset. So the frequency offset is here between minus 250 to plus 250 hertz to account for a mis small mismatch in tuning. The Watterson model is a special model that simulates the properties of the ionospheric HF propagation. So basically this is a model that introduces fading. And it does so by inputting, by modeling the, the transmission as a multipath multipath uh, propagation and by adding random Doppler spectra. So you have an input here, some, t some delay line and you have some signal components at different delay times and, the and these are altered by a random Doppler spectrum. The CCIR uh, 520 standard provides practical values to uh, parameterize the Watterson model and there are like these five fading channels defined like good, poor, pure, moderate, flutter and Doppler that are used in my training set generation. The output of the training set is uh, signals that have 2048 IQ samples that corresponds to a recording time of around 300 milliseconds. The bandwidth is up to 3 kilohertz. In total I have generated 120,000 data signals for training and 30,000 additional for testing the neural network. The data set I've generated is available on my website panelradio-sdr.de. This is what the data looks like in the data set. For example, here are some Morse code signals with high SNR, medium SNR, low SNR. The PSK signals are shown here and some exemplary FSK signals can be seen here. So you can see the IQ signals, you can see the influence of SNR and there is also, um, you can also see the influence of um, frequency offsets, which is quite high here and a little bit lower here. So we have generated um, a variety of different signals that can be used now for training. The neural networks I've built, there are three neural networks that can be used for the signal classification. They all have around 2.4 million parameters. The first one is a classical convolutional neural net with eight layers and it consists of convolutional layers followed by pooling layers, the structure we've seen before several times and in the end we have some dense layers. The all convolutional net has only convolutional layers and no pooling. It has here 13 layers. The deep CNN has here 17 layers and it's composed of convolutional layers, always two convolutional layers and one pooling layer. And again, the same structure repeating again and again. The residual net is a very powerful net. It has 41 layers and it's really hard to train such a, a large neural network. So researchers have come up with this kind of technique which is called residual connections that make training possible for these kind of deep layers. And you can see the residual stack that has been introduced by O'Shea 
which can be used for classifying signals. And what is characteristic in this structure is that you have shortcuts here that like circumvent certain layers. And that is the kind of trick to make training more robust. This is how the system was trained. On the x-axis, you can see the number of epochs. So I have trained for 30 epochs. And you can see that how the accuracy changes, the accuracy of the classification changes over training. You can already see after one epoch, so one epoch means um, every data has been fed into the training algorithm once, that the accuracy is at 70%, which is very good because um, if you choose randomly among the 18 modes, you would come up with 5.6% of accuracy. So it's already after one epoch, the network has learned a lot to distinguish between these 18 modes. And then after 30 epochs, you come up with um, accuracy, for example, here for of 94%, which is pretty good value. The training is done with a TensorFlow software using an atom optimizer. And the training time here is around one to five hours on a usual desktop PC, depending on the net you want to train. Here are the results of the, of the accuracy over SNR. So SNR, you can see here on the x-axis, on the y-axis, we have again accuracy. An accuracy of one means it can perfectly classify every signal. And the first thing we see is that classification performance is dependent on SNR. So for very low SNR, the network um, is not working so well as it is with high SNR values. But for high SNR values, you can see that an accuracy of 98% can be obtained. And this can be obtained by the ResNet, by the residual net, the one with a, with a large number of layers, 41, and the deep net. The other networks with 8 and 11 layers, they are a little bit inferior. But you can also see that for this neural network, it's possible to go beyond an accuracy of 95% for high SNR values. So the, le the learning of this synthetic data was very successful. Okay, I've shown how this classification system can be built for 18 different modes. With recent technology, we have in deep learning and for synthetic data, it was possible to achieve a very high accuracy. So this is a very promising result. Nevertheless, the data was synthetically and it will be a task of the future to analyze the performance of this classification system for real world data. And what is also interesting is to include more modes. Now I have considered 18 modes, but in in reality, on the short wave bands, it is believed that there are hundreds of different modes. So this concludes my talk and I thank you very much for your interest. Stefan, thank you very much. This was a very interesting talk again. Um, in fact, we're, well, we have a block of uh, artificial intelligence talks here. And uh, personally, what I find most interesting is that, that you've presented the, the fundamentals of artificial intelligence very, very uh, understandably, right? So that, that even if you don't have a background in artificial intelligence or in statistics, uh, you see those layers, you see how they interact. but. Nevertheless, I have a question. Maybe I've missed it because I've been researching in the background a little. Um, what is the minimal data item you're working with? Because that's kind of difficult. I mean, in, in computational linguistics, it's obviously a word or a trigram or n-gram 
so that you're putting words together because uh, if, you're, if you're talking about uh, statistical analysis in terms of language, um, you always have pieces of a language in, in close neighborhood. So, but, but what is the minimal data item uh, which you can use in order to, to classify a signal? Because a signal is a stream like in language, but you have to chop it into pieces. What do you do there? Yeah, that's exactly what I do. I chop it into pieces. So it's um, always 2048 samples, um, IQ samples, so complex samples uh, with a um, sampling rate of 6 kilohertz. So I'm just looking at the signal portion that has a duration of approximately one third of a second. So this is very little. But in fact, um, the results show that this is enough to distinguish these signals. Of course, if you have a signal that varies very slowly, like the weak signal modes, um, then looking only at uh, like three tenths of a second is not enough and you should have a longer look on the signals, maybe over some seconds. Okay, very interesting, thank you. Um, well, we have a, a couple of questions here in the chat, but we're ahead of, uh, we're behind of time. Uh, your talk was longer, uh, and we didn't modify the schedule so much, but we also have a shorter talk now, so it, it matches together again. I'd like to, to keep the questions for the panel later. Um, so we'll see you again, Stefan. Uh, thank you very much again.